Leicester-born actress of Antiguan descent, Josette Simon has graced our stages and screens for the last four decades. Soon after studying at the Central School of Speech and Drama, Josette joined the Royal Shakespeare Company. During her time with the RSC, Josette played several of Shakespeare's prime female roles, one of the most celebrated being Cleopatra in Iqbal Khan's Antony and Cleopatra in Stratford and London. Meanwhile, on screen, Josette has been immortalised in a number of films and TV series, my particular favourites being her performance of Dr. Rampele in Richard Attenborough's Cry Freedom and Lydia Thomas and Steve McQueen's final film in the Small Axe anthology, Education. With all this under her belt, it is unsurprising that Josette was awarded an OBE for services to drama in 2000. Most recently, Josette will be playing Angela Regan, the lead defence lawyer to British politician James Whitehouse in the upcoming Netflix psychological thriller and courtroom drama, Anatomy of a Scandal. Josette, welcome to TVB Talks. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Firstly, how are you? How is everything going? Good, actually. Yes, I'm good. I mean, it's been it's a mad busy at the moment because Anatomy is about to come out. It comes out on the 15th of April. So there's a huge amount of publicity being done and I'm running from pillar to post. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good fun. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really well. Amazing. Well, I'm very excited to talk to you today. Firstly, not, not directly related to Anatomy of a Scandal. Um, for someone like me, who's at the beginning of their own career in the arts industry, it's very mm -hmm. interesting to know about how you first got started doing everything. And I read in your interview with The Guardian that your family weren't necessarily supportive of you becoming an actor. So I wanted to ask you, what was it that drew you to acting in the first place? How did you know about this industry if it wasn't something that your family were pushing you into or had experience in? Very good question. A very long question. So I'm going to try. <laughs> this is a really long story. OK, OK. So I'm the youngest of four. My father and my mum came over the Windrush generation. They met over here, actually, in Leicester, which is where I grew up. And my dad was really intelligent, but didn't go to university or anything like that. Couldn't even do the job that he was qualified for when he got to the UK. Had to couldn't get uh, employed in his kind of level of expertise. So worked in a factory and, you know, but it was really important to him that the, the children did well. And my two brothers, my elder brothers, both studied pure maths, one at Cambridge, one at Birmingham. My sister got married, had lots of children. That was her road. And then it was me, also very studious, straight A's, all that kind of thing. Very interested in languages. On my way to university, my route was going to be university uh, to be a translator or an interpreter in French, German, and English. So mm -hmm. that was my thing. So never been to theatre, never been to cinema, had no acting of any kind in my family, didn't, wasn't a child who jumped up on the table when the fridge light came on, you know, all that kind of thing, and didn't even do drama at school. So nothing at all in my background, right? Nothing at all. So my best friend, Sharon, who's still my best friend to this very day, used to do ballet and tap and this sort of thing on a Saturday morning. And mm -hmm. we were at secondary school, all girls grammar school. And she, what she saw in the local paper when we were about 13 for kids to audition for Joseph and his amazing technical dream cut in the children's choir. I'm trying to, to get this in quick. And she said, oh, I'm going to go and do that. Will you come with me? And I said, no, absolutely not. No, I don't want to do that. And she said, please, please. I said, no, no, I'm not interested. She said, please. So I did. I went with her. We both got in to the children's choir. Very popular in Leicester. Kept being revived. We were revived with it. There was a lovely thing to do off of school. Great hobby. Enjoyed it. Cast us in some pantomimes and then a couple of directors cast me in some straight plays in the studio. In the Leicester Haymarket, this was. And it was really enjoyable. And I loved it. It was good. And one of the one of the brothers in the in Joseph was Alan, an actor called Alan Rickman, who you might have known, played uh, Nape in Harry Potter. People kept saying to me, oh, you know what? You're really good. You're a really, really good actress. You should you should think about doing this. And I was like, no, I love it after school, but I'm not doing it as a career. You must be joking. And then one ordinary day on an ordinary week, not to do, to do with end of term, anything. I was 17 and I had what's called, I can only call a road to Damascus moment. And I knew right in the depths of my soul that I wanted to be an actor. I absolutely knew it for certain. And I decided that's what I was going to do. So I decided to do that. I asked them what the best drama school was in London. They said Central School. I wrote to them. I had to go and audition over a weekend. I got in. I was so young that it's not arrogance. It's just like the youth thing. I had no idea that thousands of people auditioned and they only take 29. You know, it was like, 
anyway, I got in there and that's where I went. But my family were really upset when I decided to be an actor, my parents especially, even the head teachers at my school. And my parents, yeah, they never got it. I mean, even though I've, you know, I've won all the theatre, I've won, you know, the Deliverant Laurence Olivier, the Evening Standard, you know, awarded the OBE for services to drama, as we said, and all that. They never got over it till the day they died. And no one in my family has seen anything I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? I have to tell you that that's the first time in that Guardian interview that I ever said that publicly. The very first time in all these years, in many hundreds of interviews that I've had. And I think the reason was that my dad died a couple of years ago and my mum died some years before that. And I think maybe I was protecting them a bit by yeah. not not telling the truth because if there's one question I've been asked throughout my career it's oh my god your parents your family's been so proud of you and I've shrugged and I've gone yeah 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 no yeah and my dad died and I was at the bedside with both my parents when they died just me and when they took their last breath it was me who was there hugging them mm -hmm. and I had the time when my with my mom and later with my dad to talk to them about this whole thing and to tell them how much it hurt how much pain it caused me and everything and I, I really was able to say what I felt and at the end of which with both of them I was able to say you know I really love you though I love you and I forgive you mm -hmm. and that kind of lifted something for me so when I was asked this question a few weeks ago for the Guardian thing I was about to go ah! and then I thought you know what I'm not going to lie anymore they, mm -hmm. they, they both died I'm not you know I'm not going to hurt them by saying it in public but I'm not lying anymore and so I told the truth. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a very interesting and uncommon story into acting to some extent. Very, yeah. yeah. But also <laughs> kind of like an annoying one from the perspective of someone like you got in Central the first time. Well, everything happened. I know. I, d I have to say, I get a lot of letters from young people who are starting out and want, and I get a lot asking for advice. What do you think? And, you know, how, what happened to you? What's the best thing? What do you think about how I should, you know, whatever. One thing I say to them, don't do what I did. <laughs> I was really lucky. You know, I had no idea how competitive it was. You know, there's impetuousness of youth. You know, I, I had no idea. Um, no, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, so I try to give really, really good advice, which is mostly to do with the fact that you've got to have a really thick skin to do stuff in the arts because... It doesn't matter what level you get onto, how how at a high level, whether you're starting, whether you're experienced, you're always going to be rejected at certain points. You know, there's always going to be, you know, even with people like say Viola Davis and Judy Dench and Helen, you know, there's going to be times when some of you both people want the part and only one is going to get it, you know. So it doesn't matter. So if you're somebody who, if you're you come up against the many knocks that you will come up against if you're in the arts and being rejected at times for all kinds of reasons not that it's not nothing to do with your talent just for all sorts of ridiculous reasons if if that's going to make you crumble on the floor and not be able to get up again and keep going then that there's that is the business is not for you, you know? mm -hmm. um you've got to keep going no matter what um you've got to have something a fire in your belly that says this is what i i have to i i want to do this i need to do this i have to do this i can't explain why mm -hmm. This is something I want to pursue, you know, and, and I will battle my way. I was lucky to get to drama school and all that. But thereafter, when people look at my CV, they look at it, they go, oh, my God, look at all the stuff you've done. And you did this and then you did that and then you did this and then you did that. And I said, no, no, uh, 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 hold it right there. No, no, no. I didn't know. Everything, single thing has been a battle. Everything is about being in a boxing ring with my big boxing gloves on. It's all been a fight. It still is a fight to some extent, you know, it doesn't get easier, it gets easier in some ways, but you've got to be prepared to battle. Mm -hmm. And what's going to keep you going is this absolutely visceral need in the depth of your being. This is what you want to do. Mm -hmm. No, and I think that that's probably the fact that you did it despite your family not being supportive of it is a key sign of that character trait that you need to survive. Yeah, because you don't know. You know, especially when you're starting out, you, you know, you're not, you're not starting out to be a success. You're mm -hmm. starting out to do what it is you feel you really want to do. And you approach each thing to try and make it the best that you can make it. You know, you're not doing it to be famous. You're not doing it for, you're doing it to try and be good at what it is that you 
this thing that you want to do. And so you have no idea whether it's going to be successful or not. Yeah. Well, I like that, actually, because I was going to ask you, what does success look like? And I think you've kind of answered it there by saying it, it's in each project. That yeah, there's... I don't know. I know this is going to sound really s- silly and people are going to go, oh, don't. But I don't know what success looks like. Looks like I know what success looks like to other people, and I can see it, and I can see their point. However, to me, success is about what you're doing next. Mm-hmm. You know, if you think, "Oh, I was brilliant in the thing that I've just done," you know, and you carry it into your next job, and kind of, it, it, you're just gonna, it's not going to come to anything because everything is a new day, new challenge, a new pursuit in wanting to make it the best you possibly can make it which is really hard in itself whenever you you know finish something and then start something else it's like a clean slate it doesn't matter how much success you've had at stuff in the past it doesn't guarantee that you're gonna that you know your your only focus is to want to be to make this thing as good as you possibly can Mm -hmm. that's it you never sat i'm never satisfied so you're always trying to make it better there's no harsher critic on this planet than me myself and I you know and even when other people are saying oh my that's so good I'm like no it's not it's got to be better than that it's still not still not getting it <laughs> well <laughs> let's let's talk about your most recent project then yeah an yeah. anatomy of a scandal yeah um, so this series is based on Sarah Vaughan's international best-selling novel and follows James Whitehouse, played by Rupert Friend, an MP who was put on trial when he was accused of raping one of his administrative aides, Olivia Lytton, played by Naomi Scott. And yeah. like I said in the introduction, you're playing the lawyer for James Whitehouse, Angela Regan. Yes. <laughs> so firstly, I wanted to ask you, did you have a knowledge of this book before you came to the part? Had you read the book? Um, I hadn't read the book before I came to the part. And actually, the first thing I did read was they sent me the scripts to look at. Mm -hmm. And I had just got back from finishing a job and I got home really, really late and they curried the scripts over. So I thought, oh, do you know, I read I read episode one and then I'll go to sleep and I'll I'll read the rest tomorrow. Well, I was on my sofa till the early hours of the morning. (laughs) Still reading because, I mean, it was a page turner and a half. You know, it was. And so I read the whole lot one go and I thought it was just a fantastic s- script. And then when I was on board to do the job, I did look at the book. I did look at the book. So I'd, I'd seen the script first before the book. Mm-hmm. And I looked at the book and I read, so, I, you know, I kind of read, went through it. But it was sometimes it's helpful to read a book. But sometimes if, as in this case, the script is so well written, because in the end, what you're bringing to life is the script. And if it's been well written and it, and it has served the book so well that you've got all that substance in the script, then the book's helpful, but the script can stand on its own. It was helpful to look, look at the book, but my character for certainly is very different in the book. Okay. So, so in fact, you know, that came from the script for me. So the book was written, it was published in 2018, and then a year later was when Me Too really boomed as a a campaign and and became something that was in our public consciousness, these issues, consent, power dynamics, and I guess just the complexity of the issue of consent, which I think the series unpicks really well. And yeah, do you think that these are particularly urgent issues to explore at this current moment? 100%. Yeah. And in fact, in some ways, you see that that is something of a difference between the book and the script. There are certain nuances in the script that kind of address things that are more contemporary Mm -hmm. Um, that were around at the time, but they kind of bring things to the fore and things like the Me Too uh, time. There are things in, in this story that align with all that as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just in terms of, of as you say, privilege, entitlement, um, consent, women's ownership of, their, um, of, them, of themselves, um, advantage. You know, it's very particular, powerful themes that speak across all these topics and which I think and I hope and we hope will give rise to conversations, you know, important conversations about the things that this drama will throw up. Mm -hmm. And I think you have this 
almost square of these four central female characters. So mm. it's very much explored as much as there's a man at the center of it all. It's the complexities of how all these women are responding to the issue of consent as Absolutely. well, which is very yeah. interesting. Yeah, that's really well observed because, you, you know, the one, one, one great thing about working on this production is it's incredibly female heavy. It's, you know, in a way that's not common, actually, to be honest. Um, you know, the director, the writer, the producer, um, Sarah Vaughan, it, it's extraordinary in that respect. Um, plus the fact that the women are at the women are at the forefront of this drama, not only in those amazing roles, as I say, director SJ and the, the producers, the writer, Melissa Jane Gibson, but also the women in the drama. Are, it's very much uh, the, the women are at the forefront in terms of how they privately respond to the things that are being thrown up here, you know, mm -hmm. and also in some ways the juxtaposition of their public selves and their private yes yeah so Definitely. it's a it's a very female heavy production and story yeah and i think that there's an interesting complexity to the character as well in particular your character angela so i wanted to ask you a bit about your your thoughts on angela obviously she's the uh, She's defending. I love Angela. I just, got to, <laughs> I just got to tell you this right here. Okay. I love Angela Regan. I, uh -huh. I, I, I adore her. You know, you don't always love your characters. I mean, you have to uh -huh. like characters because any character, you know, even if you're playing Hitler, you've got to play. No, but you've got to play it from Hitler's point of view. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? You, you can't make a judgment about the person because mm -hmm. you are playing that person. But Angela Regan is somebody who I, I yeah, I love her. So I love the scene um, in episode three. It's when you have the first long interrogation of Olivia Lytton. And mm. I was just struck watching this. It must be great as an actor having a courtroom drama where the dialogue is so prominent. And yeah, is that fun for you to perform? Was that something you read and you were like, this is going to be great for me to get my teeth into? No, that's not what I think at all. No. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I haven't seen, I haven't seen anything because I'm funny like that. Okay. Yeah. I watch things months after they've gone out because... Um, then I'm completely objective and I watch it. It could be anybody. And I'm watching it <laughs> weighing it up and I'm learning things from it that I feel like, yeah, no, that's good to learn and remember. Da, 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 da. So I, I don't see anything before then. Uh, all the others have seen it. I haven't. And I never do that because before that point, I'm subjective and I make life a misery for myself and everybody around me. Because I, if I watch it before then, I'm like, ah, 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 ah. Ugh. No, it's just not worth it. I've learned this about myself. So there's no point in my watching it at the moment. Yeah, I'll do it in like four or five months time and that'll be fine. But no, I don't approach something and think, oh, this will be fun. I don't do, you know, every, I, <laughs> the funny thing is, the thing that I like most in my work is I like a challenge. You know, I like a challenge. I, I like to do things. That, and I've said to my friends and my daughter and people, you must always do the thing that frightens you. You know, you must always do the thing you th that you think, oh, my God, that's so hard. I don't know if I can. So I saw the potential. I could see the potential in this, these, a scene like that. But there's so much going on to get you to that point. You know, you've got to remember that when you're looking at scenes like that, you're looking at words on a page. That's all you're looking at. And you don't immediately think, oh, I'm going to do that like that. And then I'm going to say, yeah. it. and yes, you can identify that that line's quite witty or that's funny or that's clever. Or, oh, I like the way that turns, you know, and things like that. But it's up to you to bring all that to life. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it ain't easy, let me tell you. You know, so the last thing in my mind when I look at things like that, oh, it's, oh this is going to be fun. <laughs> it's like, I can see the potential of what this scene's ne scene needs, especially as I work on it more and find out more about the character, find out more about what she's trying to achieve, find out more about what the kind of line through that scene is, what it, what it needs, where it dips, where it goes up. You know, you've, I try and identify all those things, a fine tooth comb. But your overriding feeling, or my overriding feeling is, yes, it could be a fun scene, it's a fun scene, but I've got to find it, you know, and it's got to be believable. And it's really hard. Mm -hmm. I have to really understand what she's trying to do, I have to be real, I have to bring her to life. I've got to, there's a, there's a reason why it goes the way it does. There's a reason why she chooses to do something like that, say it like that, turn it around like that, lead you down this little path and then confound you, whatever. 
when I watched the scene, I thought you did it fantastically. So hopefully in a couple of months time, you'll be able to watch it back and, and actually enjoy it as well. Oh, thank you. I think actually, you know, what's funny is that obviously when you're filming, you do things over and over again, right? You do what's called a master shot where you get everybody's in, you can see the whole courtroom and you can see, and they do it at different angles and anything and, and, and little snippets and pickups and you do it a hundred times, but you know, in the, in, in the course of a whole day, which is hours and hours and hours start really early in the morning, finish quite late. So towards the end, I think, when you've done it quite a lot and you're this and that, and I'm still changing it to, to the very last shot, I'll change the way I've done a line. I don't just churn it out exactly the same way each time. There were times within that, and I thought, oh, this, oh I enjoyed that. Yeah. <laughs> that's after many hours of doing it. It's not there at the beginning, but hopefully by the time you've done it and you thing and you've, you completed the scene, you think, well, actually, you know what? That was fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's rare, though, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I also wanted to ask you, yeah, a bit more about your process for performing the part of Angela, because I, I mean, you've obviously done a range of different characters over the course of your career. And I feel like maybe parts in the world of Shakespeare, those have the pressures of you've seen people do those a million times before so audiences might have some preconceptions of characters mm. the characters with a real life reference yeah. point, like Maggie and Arthur Miller's After the Fall but a character like this feels a bit more original but does that come with its own challenges even though it's not necessarily got the same reference point because like you said it's so different from um, in the book yeah, the thing about it is um, it, it, even all the, the kind of leading women stuff that I did at, uh, at the Royal Shakespeare Company or the National Theatre, which was the Arthur Miller, uh, especially with the Royal Shakespeare Company, you may have seen in the past or other people most definitely have seen so and so and such and such and this person and that person over the years do the same part and they'll go, oh, you know, I saw, I saw Judy Tench play that part. She was absolutely brilliant. And you think, you know, thanks for that. What you learn is that you have to wipe your head clean of all that, as if it's never been seen before, never been done before. You don't know anything about that character. This is when you're doing kind of classical stuff with the RSC. You have no idea who that person is. You've never seen it. You've never read it. The audience has never seen it. This is my thing. And I wipe all that from my brain as if it's a completely new piece that I know nothing about. I don't care if I saw such and such do it or so and so or whether the audience has seen it a million times or whether, you know, it's gone down in history as this person's greatest performance in the history of all time. You know, I treat it in exactly the same way as I would treat a modern piece like Angela in Anatomy of Scandal. So I then approach it in terms of what I need to do to fully understand who that character is, fully understand what's going on, fully understand where they've come from, who they are, every detail of their person mm -hmm. in order to breathe life so that anybody watching it, whether they're watching you in theatre, doing a classical thing, or whether they're watching Angelina, they believe you as that character. It's the mm -hmm. only thing that matters. And, you know, if I'm doing something in the theatre that an audience knows, you know, knows that character so well or seen other people or know it or think they know, like, you know, 100,000 people would tell me who Cleopatra was just before I, you know, and that's their opinion. You know, it's not my opinion. It's not, I don't, I, do you know what? I don't want to know what your opinion of Cleopatra is. No, I really don't. Go away. Thank you. I've got to clear my mind. So even if people have seen something a hundred times, to me, I'm, I'm thinking no one's ever seen this play before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a brilliant answer. <laughs> also returning to the Guardian interview, I found it very interesting, a lot of your answers to that. Yeah. But in particular, the question about what you would choose between money, sex and fame. Yes. It's money, because then you could start your own production company. And yes. I just wanted to finish with that question. Like, are there any further milestones that you would like to achieve in your career? And I guess also... The whole thing about having a production company seems to link to me to kind of themes that are explored in Anatomy of a Scandal in terms of power and the fact that when you have money, you have power. And then you can also, as a woman, uh, picking what parts you play, stuff like that. Mm. All of those themes seem to me to be related, but I wanted to open yeah. the question to you. Yeah, um, the reason I answered that about yeah, more money to start my own production company, is because it wasn't necessarily about power, because um, 
you need a lot of money to actually have a production company and most of the money that you have goes into financing you know whether it's a film or a you know so the, the reason I answer that is because I do feel quite strongly about this in terms of that certainly in my profession you are at the mercy of other people you know you're at the mercy of people asking you to do this which is fine you know that's the thing yeah I'd like to be in charge of not only what I do but opportunities for others I've just done a short film which I did for virtually nothing actually before after anatomy and before what well, I've just been working on which thing called an Anansi boys which you might have yeah. heard of yeah yes yeah. so I did this short film with a with a, a a small company called Rusty Penny Productions and they're three mixed race guys uh young guys and they have written this short film which I think is absolutely brilliant and the three of them have written it uh one's directing it they're all first timers and two of them are acting in it and then they had this rather strange part this uh, this person which they were desperate for me to play and I read the script and I said yes absolutely yep do it for 2p I'll do this and I did it and they were great and uh, they were like oh my god I can't believe you did our film for us Mm -hmm." (laughs) Um, I think they are unbelievably talented I am so passionate about these guys that I will shout from the rooftops for as long as I live because they deserve a break they deserve to go so far because they are brilliant and they're young and they're just starting out. And I said to them, and they said, will you keep in touch? I said, what do you mean? Will I keep in touch? You won't be able to get rid of me. I'm your mentor, right? And I'm going to make sure you get on, on the map because you deserve it. You are brilliant. So in terms of when I talk about having enough money for a production company, yeah, I want to be in charge of my own stuff. You know, not only opportunities for other people, not just parts for myself. And not always have to wait to be asked to do stuff, but also to give opportunities to people like, Josh and Gavin and Aaron, who, you know, starting out. But yeah, it's, 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 it would be nice to be in charge of your own destiny rather than, than having to wait for people to give you stuff. I'm very grateful for people giving me things and asking me to do that. Of course I am. But yeah, I'd like, I'd like to be in charge of the, of the engine. <laughs> uh, I'm going to finish with a couple of short questions. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> so the aim of this is that you're supposed to answer straight away. Right. Comes to your mind. Firstly, what is a book that you have to have in your collection? <gasps> um, the Midnight Library by Matt Haig. What is a song or album that defines the soundtrack of your life to date? Oh, God, what a question. What a question. <laughs> oh, you're the best thing that ever happened to me, which is uh, about my daughter, who is the best thing that's ever happened in my life. Oh, lovely. What is a film or TV show that you can watch or have watched repeatedly? Afterlife with Ricky Gervais. What is the first stage production you saw and what did it mean to you? Oh, my God, the first stage production that I saw. Well, it would have been Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor <laughs> Dreamcoat, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> you know, because I'd never seen anything before I was in the children's choir for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, no, it's just, it just was fun. It's fun. And finally, what's made you sad, mad and glad this week? Anything about Ukraine makes me sad, makes me cry, actually. As it did with Africa, but I have to qualify that. So I was the same with Afghanistan, Syria, people coming over on the boat from, you know, Calais. You know, that, well, that whole thing. What made me mad? What made me mad? What made me mad? Oh, God, what made me mad? What made me mad? Oh, God, what a question. Oh, I think someone just some twit pulling out in front of my car and, you know, just being <laughs> idiot, nearly, nearly crashing into me. So that made me mad. And what was the other one? Glad. Glad. Oh, anything to do with my daughter makes me glad. My, my daughter's at university and we are very, very close. She'll just ring me for a chat. She might be in the, in the grocery sto- shop uh, getting some tomatoes and she'll ring up just for a chat. And, you know, I love it. So, you know, that, that always makes me glad. Yeah. So just to finish then, how can audiences catch Anatomy of a Scandal? Uh, they can catch it uh, from April the 15th on Netflix at 9 p.m. And they can, it's six parts. I'm in episodes two to six. Um, they can choose to watch it every week, but I think they're going to bin drop the whole thing and binge watch it throughout the night. Yes, so, I definitely April the 15th, 9 pm, Netflix. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josette. Not at all. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Really good questions. Thank you.